trust you You give me reasons to trust you
Cause who you were is who you are. And who you are is who you'll always be. I just want to take a few seconds to explain that. It says who you were is who you are. I don't know about you, but I've had some people in my life that were one way one day in a completely different way the next. But I'm so happy that we serve a God that's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that deserves a praise in this house in itself. Somebody touch somebody said, thank you for being consistent. Thank you, God, for being consistent. When we aren't consistent, he's still consistent. So we give you the praise. Oh, because who you were is who you are. And who you are is who you'll always be. Consistent who you were is who you are. And who you are is who you'll always be. You're in control of who you were is who you are. in control who you were is who you are and who you are is who you long way say in control everybody in control who you are is who you is who you are and who you are say who you are is who is who you are in control in control who you are it's who you it's are. who you are. And who you are, say. Who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. When we can understand it, he's in control. Who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And who you are, say. Who you are. It's 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 who you are. And who you are, say. Who you are is who you'll always be. Oh, who you were is who you are. And who you are is who you'll always be. We give glory to God. We give glory to God.
Pour out our prayer. 
else we give it to, Lord. We give our praise to you, Lord. Oh, we pour it out, we pour it out, Lord. Oh, we give you our highest praise. Oh, there's not like you, Lord, not like you, Lord. So great, so great, so great. Everybody just lift up those hands. The presence of the Lord is in this place. What a sweet presence in this place. Jesus. Come on, everybody. Come on, everybody. We worship you, God. How sweet is your presence, God. Have your way, have your way in this place. Just sing along. Yeah. Have your way, have your way in this place. Come on, sing along with me. Have your way. Have your way in this place. Tell him tonight, Lord, have your way. Have your way. Have your way on this ground. Oh, have your way. Have your way in this place. From the bottom of your heart, like a prayer tonight. Have your way, have your way in this place. Holy Spirit, have your way tonight. Have your way, have your way in this place. Come on, everybody, lift up that sound. Holy Ghost, have your way, have your way. Have your way, have your way in my life. Come on, everybody, say, have your way in my life. Have your way, have your way in my life. Oh, have your way.
Branda Lebrana Kata Libra Have your way Have your way in this place Pray from the depth of your soul Have your way Oh Lord Have your way of your own soul, you say, have your way, have your way, have your way in this place, come on one more time, you tell him, have your way, have your way in this place, have your way. Lord, we pray for the United States of America. We pray for all the families represented tonight. We pray for the church. We pray for pastors. We pray for leaders. We pray for our children. We pray for the next generation. We pray for our babies. Come on, lift up your hand. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. Somebody worship him. Such a sweet presence in this place tonight. If I were you, I would key into this. What God wants to do in this place tonight. He wants to do exceeding abundantly above anything you can ask. We're going to worship for a few more minutes. Have your way. Have your way, have your way in this place, Lord. Ah. Holy Ghost, have your way, have your way in this place. Have your way, have your way in this place. That's our prayer tonight. Come on, warrior nation, have your way. tonight when we say God just have your way in this place do what you do best Holy Spirit do what you do best we're so hungry tonight God. so thirsty God we're so hungry we're so thirsty So I crave, I crave for you, and I long, I'm longing for you. Come on, lift up those hands and say, I crave, I'm craving for you, God. I need you more than breath. 
Jesus, if you love him tonight, the loudest clap offering. I know you can do better than that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory, 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 glory. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Glory to the Lamb of God. Glory to the Lamb. We crave, we crave, we crave, we crave, we crave. We long, we long, we long, we long. Lord God, have your way, Lord have your way in this place, we cry you Lord of Lords, we cry you King of Kings, you are the ancient of days, the everlasting God, some call you El Shaddai, some call you Adonai, we call you Yeshua Messiah. We call you Yeshua Hamashiach. Somebody lift up a praise. Lift up a praise. Lift up a praise. Hallelujah. 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 How many of you are finding yourself more in love with Jesus every day? Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. Thank you so much, men and women of God. Lord, I just want to thank this amazing worship team here every Sunday. They bring the word of God. How are you all doing tonight? Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Well, I want to welcome all of you to M633 Church tonight. In his presence, there's fullness of joy. At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. We're so grateful every time God gives us the privilege of coming out to worship as a family. This is your father's house. Just relax and have a great time in his presence. Can you say amen? Amen and amen. Lord, I just want to use a moment and lift up um, Kobe's family. Um, we just pray for peace and just tranquility over his wife and kids, Lord. And nobody can comfort like you do. So we just pray that your comforting grace will be extended to them in the name of Jesus. I also pray for my uncle who just lost his sister in Chicago. May the same comfort of the Holy Spirit just shield each and every one of them and anybody else that has lost a loved one, I pray that the peace of God will cover you where you are right now in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says amen. Wow, things like this um, help us appreci appreciate life the more. As we pray the prayer of Moses, we say, God, help us to number our days. Help us to number our days. If you are alive, it's a blessing. Amen. There are, there are a lot of people out there that um, they're here today and gone tomorrow. And we're not alive because we're more righteous or more better, but because of the grace and the mercy of Almighty God. Can you say amen? All right. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about a subject I've titled Seek First, which is taken from Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Matthew 6, 33, it's one of our most favorite scriptures, the very scripture on which M633 church was born, is taken from Matthew chapter 6, and we, what we're going to do is we're going to just read this in unison tonight, we're going to read it in one accord, and we're going to read it until I feel like we've understood it. Can somebody say amen? I want to say anybody who lays a hold of this message tonight. That's why I don't feel like preaching it 
I just want to talk about it. I want to talk to you all tonight. My heart to your own heart. My soul to your own soul. As a brother in the faith, just open up my heart to you about this scripture. Let's see what the Lord will do here tonight. Can somebody say amen? amen. But anybody, I, I feel like there's somebody out there. I was praying earlier today and I just felt like somebody out there is going to lay a hold of this message. And they're going to lay a hold of it, not because it's Pastor Sino teaching it. They're going to um, lay a hold of it, not because, um, not because they're trying to impress somebody. They're going to lay a hold of it because I believe there's something that God wants to do in each and every one of us. And if you can lay a hold of this message tonight, I promise you something amazing is going to happen to your life. One of the things I've come to learn is it's not in the moment of the message that counts only. It's not in the moment of the message that counts only. is the aftermath of the service. What you do with what you hear. And you have no idea. All weekend I've been praying. I say, God, please do not let this word fall on empty ground. This word has to produce for you. Somebody somewhere is going to lay hold of this truth and their lives will never be the same. Ever, never, ever, never. And I hope that that's you in this place tonight. I didn't get a response. I said, I hope that's you tonight. All right, Matthew chapter number 6, beginning at verse 33. And I read. I'm reading this first in the King James Version. And it says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this together, okay? Is that okay, family? Yeah. All right, family, let's read it together. At the count of two, one, two, go. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I like, I like that one. I like that you've personalized that scripture. That's really nice right there. And um, I wanted to ask you all, do you believe that when Jesus said this, he meant it? So you're trying to tell me tonight that when Jesus said all these things will be added to you, that he actually meant that all these things will be added to you? How many of you believe that tonight? Okay. Well, what are all these things that Jesus said he was going to add to us? In Matthew chapter 6, I want to begin at verse 24 through 25. Like I said, I'm just talking to you from my heart tonight. And it says, no man can serve two masters, for either they will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold on to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Another translation here says, you cannot serve God and money. If you don't mind, just declare after me, say in the name of Jesus, I will never serve mammon. We're going to say that again and I, I, want to, I want to feel the conviction in your heart. I want to feel it in your voice, all right? At the count of two, you say in the name of Jesus. I will never service mammon. Can you say amen? So he says in verse 25, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Take no thought for your life. This word, take no thought for your life, doesn't mean that you shouldn't plan for the future. It doesn't mean that in this world you cannot plan for the future. You cannot have appreciating assets, whatever you think you need to have to live a better life on this planet. God is not stopping you from planning that. But it's, it's more or less an internal stance. It's, it's something I made reference to last week. It's, it's a place in your spirit where you know that you know that you know that you know God's got you no matter what. Right? You, you got to... You've got to settle this because Jesus uses the birds. He said, have you observed the birds? 
how they do not spin. They do not, it, it's a realm that they've come into. It's a realm, a consciousness that they've come into where the preoccupation of life is not about what I will eat, what I will drink, the clothes on my back, a roof over my head. And these basic necessities of life are the very things that literally drive the wheel of civilization. Think about it. You have a lot of people who have limited their worship to God on a Sunday morning. And as long as they can limit that to God on a Sunday morning, so they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a good Christian. I love God. Every Sunday morning, I'm out there. Uh, in church, doing what I have to do, hearing the word of God, and we truly do recommend that because a lot of people don't come to church now. But I believe that that tide is, is shifting. God is pulling people and, and, and creating hunger in their hearts that we must not forget the assembling of ourselves together. I see God doing a new work in that arena. However, think about what you do Monday through Saturday, some of us even on Sunday. You know, the first thing you got to do when you wake up is get ready for work, right? And nothing wrong with work in itself, but that's what we do as a society of people. You got to wake up in the morning. So let's say, for example, like most jobs, most jobs start at 8 a.m. in the morning, yes? Um, but you have to be up often at least an hour, some of you two hours before 8 a.m. I wish you were paid for the time it took to prepare for work. And nobody's listening to me. <laughs> you know, because the reason why you got ready is for the work. So the work didn't actually start at 8. It started from the time you started preparing to go to work. And then, you know, if you live in a bigger city like Chicago or New York or LA where it takes about, you know, anywhere you go is 45 minutes minimum. Atlanta, some an hour, an hour and a half. Can, can you imagine being paid for all that time? Because all that time you're commuting through the traffic is so that you can get to work. Ain't nobody paying you for that now. Right? And you have to do all of that again on your way home. You do it going, you do it coming. To do what? To put food on the table. So you do that on Monday, you do that again on Tuesday, you do that again on Wednesday, you do that again on Thursday, you do that again on Friday. Some of you on Saturday. Some of you even on Sundays. And so when the Bible says you cannot serve God and mammon, mammon is, is a spirit that drives the chase of money. The spirit that drives the chase of the American dream. In other words, it has a diabolical dimension to the chase of trying to put food on the table. And as honorable as that is, because we have to be responsible citizens, so I understand that we have to provide. That's what we do. Particularly we, the man, we have to put food on the table. We have to be responsible. We have to take care of our family. That's what we do. And God is not against that. But this is what he's against. He's against when this is what defines your life. He's against when this, is, this becomes the highlight of who you are. Outside of this, there is really nothing much to, to write home about. This is, this is what preoccupies you. This is what drives you in this world. And it drives most of us, not because we want to be driven by it, but we've been indoctrinated to believe that this is how we ought to live. Right from the time you're a child, you drive your kids to be excellent at school. To be the best that they can. Why? So by the time they graduate, they get a great job because a great job means a higher uh, uh, earning income so they can live a better life. Every parent desires that for their children. Right? But then you get this job, and what do you do with this job? You begin the process of what I call servicing debt. You begin the process of servicing debt. So we borrow all this money, mortgage, 
credit cards, car loans, and every other loan on the planet. And then with this job and the income that you get from this job, you just pay bills. And when you look at how much of your time that you give just to put food on the table, just to put a roof over your head through the storm, through the rain, and through the heat of the day, even times when you're sick and you can't take off. Now, I know that, and I've kind of used this example before, an analogy, but let me just use it again tonight. You know, if the devil were to come to you and say, listen, I'm going to give you $25 million if you give me your own soul. I just need your soul in exchange for $25 million. Now, I know a lot of people will go for that. <laughs> a lot of people will go for less for that. <laughs> I don't know about you, you know, if he piles up that cash and shows it to you in pictorial form, you may be like, man, that is a lot of dough. All you want is my soul? Uh, give me a minute. Let me talk to my wife. <laughs> but the truth is, every true child of God would never accept any amount of money in exchange for giving the devil your soul. But if you think about what we give to the world, it's actually less than what the devil is asking for. The mental energy, the emotional energy, all that you have to expand, all that you have to exert for the sake of basic necessities. The very things that the Bible says, all that Jesus wants to do is add it to you. These are things that should naturally gravitate towards you. In other words, just like the birds, it should be an afterthought. Your needs shouldn't be the thing that preoccupies your time. Your needs shouldn't be the things that preoccupies your, your thoughts. It shouldn't be the first thing you think about when you wake up and the last thing you think about when you go to bed at night. It should be such an afterthought that you never come together with your spouse or your kids and say, what are we going to eat today? Because the birds don't do that. Never in history have you seen birds conversing and saying, you know, I just have, I don't know how we're going to make it today. It's not a part of their consciousness. This is what God meant when he said, take no thought for your life. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't take care of yourself, look out for yourself, do what you have to do to take care of yourself. That's not what it means, but it's an internal disposition. It's a stance in the spirit where you know. If God can take care of birds, you are far more valuable than birds. Banish the fear. God's got you from now to the day he calls you home. So this thing about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he says all these things. The question is, are these things naturally gravitating towards you? Have you come to a place where the bills that you pay are becoming an afterthought? It's not even a part of, it doesn't factor into your day-to-day -day living. God is helping you transcend this basic need of human nature. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Now, I want to show you something here. Look at Matthew chapter 6 verse 32. Matthew 6 verse 32. The very scripture before verse 33. And we're going to read this together as one. We're going to read it in the King James. Then I want to read it to you actually in the Moffat translation. I don't think you all have it there, so I'll just read it from here. All right? Matthew chapter 6 verse 32. Brothers and sisters, at the count of two, one, two, go. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knoweth that you have need. Let's read it again. The next time you read it, read it to comprehend it, okay? So let's read at the count of two, one to go. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knoweth that ye have what? So what the Bible is saying is that your father knows. He's fully in the know. If anybody knows, God knows. 
Because he wired you, he created you, he forged you, he formed you. So he understands in ways that you and I don't even understand your own needs. He understands that you have need of these things. As long as you live on this planet, you're going to need food to eat. You're going to need water to drink. You're going to need clothes on your back. You're going to need a shelter over your head. These are basic necessities of life. The Bible says that God says he is aware that you're in need of all these things. But he says, but after all these things do the Gentiles seek. I like how the Moffat puts it. He says, pagans make all that their aim in life. Pagans. Pagans. The word Gentile there is not in the sense where God is trying to distinguish the Jews from the Gentiles. The word Gentile there simply means idol worshippers. Literally people who have no knowledge of God. People who do not know God. People who have no knowledge of God whatsoever. Pagans. Idol worshippers. How do they live? They only live for trying to put food on the table. In other words, they only live to make a living. And then Jesus is saying, if this is all you and I are doing, then we haven't really lived. Life begins when you understand that we were designed to seek first the kingdom of God. Hear me now. In your very gene, in the very DNA strands that God used to weave your internal makeup, at the very core of who you are, this is the one thing you were made to do with your life. To ardently seek the kingdom of God. This is what you were born for. And I promise you, you have, none of us have truly experienced the joy of life, the sweetness of life, till you and I give ourselves to seeking first the kingdom of God. This is why I didn't want to preach to anybody tonight. I'm, I'm praying. You have no idea. All week I've been praying. Ask, ask my wife. I was three, three nights away from home this week. Spent all night awake praying. I said, God, somebody is going to lay a hold of this truth tonight. You've got to get it. Because believe it or not, God is looking over his own children and he says, listen, I'm El Shaddai. Just look up and, and, and look at the stars. I am the possessor of heaven and earth. And since I was young, now that I'm old, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor the seed of my kid, my kid, my king, kid, my kings, my queens, the ones made in my own image. Uh -uh. All that toiling, trying to eat bread in the sweat of your face. It comes from the curse. It comes from a fallen world. And God is not saying you shouldn't work. I'm not preaching against work because you need to work. But the kind of work that God has designed for you and I is the same work he designed for the birds. The Bible says they spin not what work do you think the birds do? They just spread their wings and fly. Because that, that's in their design. And as, as long as they're living out God's design, he says, I'll take care of you. When it comes to what you need, that's God's responsibility. So what's my responsibility? My responsibility to, is to give myself to seeking first the kingdom of God. Who? Brothers and sisters, I, I tell you from my spirit, I tell you like, I wish the Holy Spirit will appear to you in person and whisper this in your own soul. If you key into this, everything changes. If you lay a hold of this truth tonight, I said everything changes. 
you got to do something with this message. If you don't mind, tell somebody closest to you and say, you got to do something with this message. You, you've got to do something with it. You, you must do something with it. You must do something with it. So in simple terms, what does it really mean to seek first the kingdom of God? What does that actually mean? Because we shoot all these amazing words around and sometimes we, we kind of use them in a way that, you know, I hear what you're saying, but what does it actually mean to seek first the kingdom? So let me break it down. If you got a pen and a paper, you can write this or your type in your, in your gadgets, you can write this down. What does it actually mean to seek the kingdom of God? This is what it means. When all about me becomes all about him. I'm trying to give you the street definition of this very phrase, seeking first the kingdom of God. Better yet, when all about me is all about souls. There is no greater definition than that. I promise you, I've done my homework on this. There is no better definition than that. Can somebody say hallelujah? Whew. I just felt the presence of God in a sweet way tonight. Praise God. What did I say that definition was? When all about you and I is all about souls. And when I say souls, I mean lost souls. That means soul winning is not just that thing I do on a Saturday afternoon when the pastor says, let's go out for evangelism. No, 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 no. This is the soul winning is, is the thing you breathe. It's a lifestyle. It's the way you live. It has become a way of life to you. So seeking first the kingdom means when all about me, when all about us, when all about you and I is all about, when all about us is all about winning souls to Jesus. There is no greater definition than that. When he says seeking first the kingdom of God. So what I want to do is let me even go ahead and break this thing down further for you. Can somebody say hallelujah? Just give me a minute here. Praise God. Here we go. Praise God. All right, there we are. Can somebody say hallelujah? All right. Now, there's a book I wrote sometime last year it's called the greatest investment if you haven't gotten a copy please get a copy of that those of you watching online you want to even start small groups or a book club around that book i really encourage you to get a hold of that book i wrote a poem in that book and the poem is titled what if and this poem literally gives us a practical breakdown of what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. So let me help you out tonight. Number one, it's called what if. So I'm going to read it. What if our thoughts, we are so winning thoughts. Let's begin there. That means if, if soul winning is not a part of your thinking, you know, there's a song uh, I used to hear back in those days, uh, uh, mind on my money and my money on my mind okay and uh, I told Alex to create a shirt that says a t-shirt that says souls on my mind and my mind on souls souls on my mind and my mind on souls that means this thing eats me up from the inside out I can't stop thinking about souls is the first thing that I think about when I wake up is the last thing that I think about when I go to bed at night. Every moment, every time, my thoughts, I'm just thinking about. And I remember when I first got filled with the Holy Spirit, I had no idea as to why all I could think about was souls. In fact, I would remember lying on my bed looking at the ceilings and, and, and saying to myself, 
What market square am I going to be in tomorrow? How many tracts am I giving out tomorrow? Um, how many souls would I love to bring to the kingdom tomorrow? These were thoughts that consumed me as a 12-year-old. And I didn't even understand it. Now, as I look back, I understand that when you're truly filled with the spirit of God, you are driven heavenward, God word. Your appetites and desires are after the things of God. What if, what if your thoughts, that doesn't mean that you don't think about other things because you have to. But the predominant thought driving you each and every day is just, what about lost souls? So if you and I are going through the day and going through the week and we've not brought a soul to Christ, something inside of you begins to hurt. That drives you to pray. I say, God, I, I've got to bring the loss to you. What if my thoughts, what if your thoughts were soul winning thoughts? I don't know what drives your thoughts. But Kobe is an example. God is using maybe his life to let us know, you know, life itself is a loan that has been entrusted to you. It's a... Uh, and it's a loan that has been given to you to hold in trust for the giver of that loan. What if? What if our decisions were soul winning decisions? That means that the, the, the thing that really drives the decisions I make are all about souls. My thoughts are all about souls. My decisions are all about souls. This is what it means to seek first the kingdom. What if my actions were so winning actions? What about the actions I took, the moves that I make, the steps that I took in life? We're all about soul winning. I'm, I'm looking for the lost. You know, this Sunday is the last Sunday in the month of January. And usually the way you handle January is a strong indication how the rest of the year may turn out for you. So I don't know why God's got me talking about this to establish the foundation on which 2020 is going to be built or rolled out for you and I. My thoughts are so winning thoughts. My decisions are so winning decisions. What if your actions were so winning actions? Think about this one. What if your money was so winning money? That means if, if, if I even have any desire to want to make money, ultimately... It's about advancing the kingdom of God. It's about making such a difference. Because at the end of it all, that's really what our lives on this planet is all about. Somebody we know as, as the Savior, King of Kings, whose name is Jesus, came on into this world and died for us on the cross and gave us his own life. And so my way of saying thank you for what you did for me is to tell others about what you've done for me. This is primarily why I'm here on earth. What if your money was soul winning money? What if your assets were soul winning assets? All the assets you have, all the assets you're trying to accumulate. What if every day was a soul winning day? Every day. That means my mission field, you know, this coming Sunday, me and Papa Victor and Patrick will be flying all the way to India to, to train thousands of pastors in the art of soul winning. That's this coming Sunday. You know, so uh, uh, K, K is going to hold the ground. PK is going to hold the ground here. Um, and uh, I know she's going to do a, a marvelous job. And I know you guys are going to rally around her and support her. And, you know, that, that pastoral oil is going to flow really strong. I know that, right? But, but what about soul winning is not limited to when you hop on a plane and go on a mission trip. It's right here in the back of your own woods. Every day is a soul. That means when I wake up, my eyes, my mind, God, who needs you? You know why you don't see them? Because it's not on your mind. You cannot see something that is not on your mind. Even if a thousand people, it's like the priest. The priest saw the Samaritan man that was beaten half dead on the ground. The Bible says he looked from a distance and just kept going. When he, when he saw ministry, he couldn't discern that God had given him a privilege for ministry. 
What if every day, every day that you, so instead of just defining my Christianity to a two hour Sunday service, I see this as a way of life and I'm living this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and I'm happy. I'm happy that on Monday I brought two people to Christ. On Tuesday I brought one person to Christ. On Friday I brought five people to Christ. Oh my God. Because you see there is an account in heaven called the soul winner's account. It's the only account that matters. In fact, it's the only account that God uses to truly define your wealth. Your wealth is measured by your soul winner's account. Who am I talking to in this place tonight? Stay with me. We're going somewhere with this. Can somebody say hallelujah? So my thoughts are soul winning thoughts. My decisions are soul winning decisions. My actions are soul winning actions. My money is soul winning money. My assets are soul winning assets. Every day is a soul winning day. What if my time was primarily a soul winning time? That means when you look at what I give myself to, instead of serving mammon, I'm serving God. And I'm serving the one thing that is more important to him than anything else. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. You must make your decision. You must choose. But do you know that 97% and uh, between 97 and 98% of the evangelical church Monday through Saturday what are they giving their lives in exchange for? If you ask the evangelical church, how many souls have you brought to Christ with your life? The statistics is astonishing. You know what the statistics says? Zero. Zero. Hear me now, church. Zero. The statistics say zero. The evangelical church. Man of God, Sunday morning we fill the churches. Yes, we, we worship God on that morning and we go back to serving mammon. We, we come back to church on Sunday morning then we go back to serving mammon. We say we don't do. But what are you giving the best of your years to? The best of your mental, emotional focus and energy to? Because Jesus' definition of serving mammon is when just putting food on the table, finding things to drink, as honorable as that responsibility is, if that has defined the highlight of your life, so it's telling us to make this shift. I need somebody tonight to run with this message. I'm asking somebody watching me online right now, I need you to do something with this. I am praying you do something with it. Maybe start a Bible club, rally people you know, your friends, gather them. This, this revelation, the church has to, if, if we have to move to the next level in God, we have to embrace this. What if our jobs were seen as soul winning jobs? Yes, I understand that God has given me a job and I need one. I need an income earned so I can take care of my needs. But the real reason why... God gave me a job for the same reason why he gave Peter a boat. All these years, Peter thought my boat was about providing for my staff. Providing for my family. Peter, that's honorable. But the real reason why God gave you that boat and Jesus taught him why. Because on that day, Jesus shows up and he initiates what we call or what we make reference to as the principle of the first. The principle of the first is when he comes and he says, Peter, can you just move the boat a little bit from the shore? He really didn't need that. He wanted to know, Peter, is this a man I can use? Can I use this man? The same way Elijah told the woman at Zarephath, um, excuse me, lady, I, can you go get me some water? The Bible says as she was going to get the water, then he said, can you bring me 
a handful of meal. He wanted to know, can I use this woman? We call it the principle of first instructions. And Peter had told the night before and caught nothing. And he, had, he, he could have said, you know, who do you think you are? I have busted my tail all night. My staff is hungry. My wife is hungry right now. You call yourself prophet. Now, what, what do you say? You, who, who do you say you are? Here you're coming telling me to, to, to do what now with my boat? That's not what Peter said. He obeyed Christ and the Bible says, and Jesus entered into his means of livelihood. And what did he do with the boat? The Bible says he preached to the people. In other words, the boat of Peter is designed for the kingdom. And only after he had satisfied the demands of the kingdom, does he turn to Peter and say, now launch out into the deep. And that's how we see that boat sinking, net breaking miracle load of fishes that came to Peter. Jesus was trying to show him a different way to live. So when God gives you a job, I've told you this is not about the paycheck. You make a big mistake if you think your job is about the paycheck. Because you see, the paycheck is simply man's compensation. It's how man values your worth. But your worth is priceless. So, so why the job? It means to an end. Why the job? So that in the job, I'm looking for people who don't know him. Who doesn't know you here? Who doesn't know you in this world, in this vicinity that I operate? Who doesn't know you here? Open my eyes to see those who do not know you here. Glory to God. What if our jobs were soul winning jobs? This is what it means when all of you is all about souls when all of you is all about there's no aspect of your life that is not connected to this if even your every decision you make is a soul winning decision every money you spend has a soul winning agenda to it who glory to god what if our dreams were soul winning dreams instead of the american dream you have a soul winning dream you can't stop dreaming how many souls you're taking with you to heaven uh oh, this is a big one. What if our prayers were soul winning prayers? Do you know, even in prayer, there's a hierarchy of prayer. Jesus taught us that there's a hierarchy in prayer. He says, When ye pray, pray this way Our Father, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Your needs is down, 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 down. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Then 1 Timothy 2 1 says, it says, it says, first and foremost, that means before you pray about anything else, first and foremost, let your prayers and intercessions and supplications be made for all men, that all men might be what? Saved. It's a hierarchy. That means even your prayers are all kingdom driven. This was the key to Solomon's wealth. Solomon comes to the Lord and he says, can you give me how to win people? That's the street language if you ask me what his prayer was. Teach me how to win people over for you. Teach me how to win the hearts of the people for the kingdom. God says, ah, oh, you have touched something, Solomon. You have touched the nerve. He said, I'm going to give you things you never even asked for. When you key into this, you will never pray another prayer when it comes to your needs. Never. Never. I said, when you fully key into what I'm teaching you tonight, you will never say, God, please heal me. You will never say, God, please deliver me. You will never even pray, God, as I take this plane from this point to this point, please keep me safe. You will never pray that prayer again. Because when you give yourself all to him, he gives himself all to you. Daniel was so known in the heavens that when the angels would come to him, they, say, they call him the beloved. That's what they called him. Daniel, why are you calling me the beloved? Man, you are famous in heaven. Me? Ah, God loves you like crazy, Daniel. 
And he tells us all about it. We know you in heaven. It was the same Daniel that says, He that turneth many to righteousness shall shine like the stars forever and ever and ever. What if? And so this is how, when all about me, when all about us, is all about soul winning. Let me read a few more. What if every platform you had was a soul winning platform? What if our very lifestyle was a soul winning lifestyle? What if all roads in life lead to the saving of his soul? That's the point. That's the point. Let me show you something else here and then we'll begin to pray. Turn with me to Luke chapter 15. And if we can pull this up in the message translation, I'm going to read it first in the King James and then we're going to see it in the, in the uh, message translation and then begin to pray. That's Luke chapter 15. I want to read verses 4. Actually, verses 3. This is a parable. It's called the parable of the lost sheep. So I'm going to read verses 4. All the way through verses 7. Then I'm going to jump to verses 10. Is that cool? And then we're going to read verses 10 in the message translation. Stay here with me. Luke chapter 15 verses 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, do it not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he finds it? Hear me now. Jesus in John chapter 10 already referred himself as the true shepherd. In fact, he distinguishes himself from a hiring when he says, if a hiring sees the wolf coming against the sheep, he would flee for his life but i'm not like that i'm the true shepherd i will literally lay down my life for the sheep but he says when it comes to the lost i will rather leave them when it comes to the lost i will leave the 99 in the dead desert when it comes to the lost i will rather leave the 99 saved and go after the lost That's what Jesus said. He said, if one of you had a sheep and one goes missing, let me break it down this way. Let's say you went to a beach in Florida. How many of you like the uh, beaches around Florida? Uh, which one do you like? This thing, right? And others like that. So let's say you go to a beautiful beach or somewhere in Mexico or somewhere around the world. And let's say you have four children. Let's say you have four boys. And the last born, let's say he's about two years old. He's two years old of age. And you guys are just playing on the beach and all of a sudden you look up and you discover the last born has gone missing. He's gone missing. So everybody's panicking, everybody's fretting. And, and they say, where's the last born? Where's, let's call him Joe. Where's Joe? Where's Joe? Where's Joseph? We can't find Joseph. Now, tell me, at that moment, who's the priority? What about the other three boys? I said, what about the other three boys, the other three sons? Does it mean that the parent doesn't love the other three boys now? No, but you are not the priority, boy. I love you. I love you all. But your brother has gone missing. You are not the priority right now. Now, think about if those boys came and said, well, I need, I'm hungry, daddy. I'm hungry, mommy. Won't you feed me? Well, you know, I, I, I need a new sh shoe. Daddy, I need, I need new Jordans. But that's what we do every Sunday morning. That's what we do every Sunday morning. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, Lord. Because my name is Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. We become a very self-absorbed generation. What the other three boys should be doing is, Daddy, how do we help you find? How do we help you find our lost brother? Sunday morning is about energizing you to do the work of the ministry outside the four walls of the church. 
ushering, greeting, choir, all of that, that's beautiful. We call it keeping the house. It's not ministry. Real ministry is like salt in a salt shaker. You can keep it preserved in the shaker and it's all safe. But it's real power is when you pour it out of the shaker. The real power of the church is not what we do on Sunday morning. With all the move of God. Uh-uh. As long as you stay locked in within the short shaker, shaker, the devil doesn't care that much. It's when you release God's people and pour them into the world. No wonder Jesus said, go, 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 go into all the world, go, go. It's an action word. It's a military word. That means I'm smack in the middle of the harvest doing what I was born to do. Something Jesus even understood at the age of 12. He said, you're looking for me? Boy, you have gone missing three days. What you mean we're looking for you? We're your parent. You're looking for me? Didn't you know? I thought you would know. What else do you think I'll be doing with my life? What else, daddy? What else, mommy, do you think I'll be employed in if it's not about my father's business? And so Jesus comes and he, he talks about his mission to seek and to save the lost. Jesus, why are you here? To seek, not just to save. I am searching. I'm I go to where the people are, the villages, the, the nook and the crannies, the backwoods, the, the highways, the city lanes, the streets, in the mall, in the coffee, all on souls on my mind and my mind on souls, souls on my mind and my mind on souls, souls on my mind. Because you see, once they are lost, they are lost forever. You couldn't pray them out, you couldn't fast them out, you couldn't do anything to pull them out of the jaws of hell. Once they are lost, they are lost. Souls on my mind and my mind on souls. This is what it means to seek first the kingdom. My thoughts, so winning thoughts. My actions. That means everything I'm trying to build, the so called life, I'm building it because of souls. When we key into this, so think about instead of defining church. As a place where we all gather, whether it's Sunday night or Sunday morning. Think about when we define church as the real work that is being done Monday through Saturday in the marketplace. Think about a hundred percent of all of us who call ourselves the evangelical church, the, the body of Christ. Think about an army of people. No crusades, no conferences, no meetings. Everybody, 100% of us, from Monday through Saturday, we're on the streets, we're everywhere. What are we doing? Introducing people to Jesus. Ah, think about that paradigm shift. That's ministry. That's ministry. That's ministry. So when we come to church on Sunday, we just, we, we stand and say, Sister Shania. Tell us about what happened to you on Tuesday. Well, pastor, you know, I was just there. Um, my kids were hungry, so I said, let me run into Walmart and get them something to, to eat. Because I got to, you know, they, they, they like this particular food, so I got to cook it. But while I got to Walmart, the spirit of the Lord moved on me in Walmart. And I, and I discovered there was a sister, and, 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 and the Lord was telling me, oh, she needs me. Now, I know my kids are hungry. I know that's important, but that's even far more important. And as she's after God's business, God is after her business. Making all these things to be added. Making all, all of a sudden she opens her mailbox. There's a check she can't explain. All of a sudden she's by the wayside and somebody says, Chanel, I, I, I just, I just, I, I don't know who you are, but I feel impressed. The Lord is asking me to do this for you. That's how this kingdom thing works. Believe it. That's how it works. When this, when you carry, carry the kingdom on your head. Let them say you're a fanatic. That's fine. 
become, if you're going to be an addict, be a kingdom addict. Be addicted to winning souls. I'm about to reveal the jackpot to life. Hi. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, because of time, let's jump to verses 10. Jump to verses 10. You all ready? You all ready? Body of Christ, let's read. One to go. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. We got to read it again. Read it by revelation. Read it by revelation. You all ready? At the count of two, one to go. Likewise, I say unto you, there is what? In the presence of the angels of God. It never said the angels rejoice when you buy a new car. Nothing wrong with buying a new car. We, we got, you know, some new cars. It never says the angels rejoice when you buy a new house. Because in heaven, those things do not matter to them. A lot of the things we think are important here are not important there. He didn't say the angels rejoice when you get a raise. As far as the scriptures are concerned, this is the only thing that makes them rejoice. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why does a lost soul coming to repentance bring so much joy to heaven? It's a revelation of where the heart of God is. It's a revelation of the things that move the hand of God. Souls. The kingdom of heaven is all about souls. All about souls. Now put this in the message translation. You see it in a whole different light. In a light that most of you have never seen it before. Put that in the message translation. Because I want us to see it together and read it together. Okay. Or imagine a woman who has ten coins. Let me read from the place where it says the last one. It says, celebrate with me. I have found my lost coin. Count on it. Count on it. That's the kind of party God's angels throw every time one lost soul turns to God. So I said to myself, I said, Sino, from today, you are going to throw Holy Ghost parties for angels. I'm going to throw so much party. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the angels turn up party after party after party after party after party after party until they start asking, who is this boy they call Sino? My life is all about Holy Ghost parties. I'm going to make the angels party. I'm going to bring so much joy I'm going to bring so much joy because this is the very thing that drives the heart of God. That's the jackpot. When you key into this, you have won the jackpot of life. When you key into this, do you know how many angels there are in heaven? I did the calculation. It's in the book. Of, the book of Revelation tells us it's in the billions there are more angels in heaven than humans on earth. Think about making that many. An I mean, I, I, you can have that kind of party going on, and the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost not say what? It, what? I, I know that. I know that shout. I know that shout. Somebody was just snatched up from the pit of hell. Glory to God! I can see the Father running around His own throne and just. I can see Jesus joining that party. Oh, I want us all to throw parties in heaven. Here's the one thing the Bible says. The last scripture I want to put on there is Luke 22.35. Luke 22.35. You can put it in the message. You can put it in the New Living Translation. 
I like it in the net, N-E-T. Luke 22, 35. And then we begin to pray. Jesus said, come on, let's all read it together. I, I can't read this by myself and leave you all out. One, two, go. Then Jesus said, when I sent you out and told you to travel light, to take only the bare necessities. Did you get a long, no, find me another translation. What kind of translation is this? This translation messed up the whole scripture. Find me a no. Find me another one. Find me the amplifier. Okay, this may be good. Then Jesus said, ask them, when I sent you out to preach the good news and you did not have, ah, now you're talking. You did not have money. This is a, God is trying to tell you, you don't have to have money when you key into this assignment. Let's read it. One to go. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you out to do what? What happened? And you did not have money or a traveler's bag or an extra pair of sandals. Did you need anything? No. Another translation says, did you lack anything? They said nothing. That means the provision is in the active pursuit of this vision. Your provision, your miracle of provision happens when you're on the go chasing after souls. When you're on the go, God looks into your thoughts even while you are asleep and all you're dreaming about, how many am I bringing out? Huh? Says, what are we going to do for him? What are we going to do for her? Jesus said, when I sent you to do this, did you lack anything? Nothing. This is the reason why I believe we're not growing as strong and as fast as we need to go grow as people of God. Because even your growth in Christ is tied to your winning souls. There's something about winning a lost person over that makes you pray differently. There's something, when you see, when you start bringing people to the faith, it will change how you read the word. Something inside of you will shift your hunger for the supernatural. will go from A to all the way up. Because you're saying, well, you know, I'm bringing all these people to Christ. Now I got to pray for them. I got to pray that they be establishing the faith. So it takes your prayer life to the next level. Well, I have to live in such a way that I can be an example. This is where we've missed it. Once you come to Christ, your life becomes all about what's most important to him. Chasing souls. I am come to seek and to save. I'm praying for that shift. Church, I'm praying for that shift. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for the body. I'm praying for all the churches. Let's make that shift. Let's make that shift. I come into Walmart and I see 20 other brothers and sisters talking to people like, oh, glory. I walk into a coffee shop. I see five born again Christians talking. Ooh, everywhere I go, just the gospel. That's how you break the back of poverty for the rest of your days. Poverty will miss your local address forever. I say poverty will fly. It, would, it, will, it won't even know your, where you live. We're making this thing too complicated. The ways of God are actually simpler than you think. But it's got to be a part of your DNA, a part of your gene. You can't fake it. It's not just going on a mission trip once a year. It's not just uh, uh, doing little things. No, it's got to be inborn. It's got to be something that consumes you and I. Can somebody say hallelujah? Just lift up your hands and let's pray tonight. Talk to him. Talk to him. Praise God. Talk to him. Praise God. If I can just have the 
band back. Just talk to him. Go ahead, talk to him tonight. Those of you watching us online, go ahead and talk to him. And I'm praying that some of you are going to do something with this message. Somebody, somewhere, by the Holy Ghost, by the hearing of the voice of the Holy Spirit, this shift has to happen. And Lord, I'm praying that it will, it will begin with me. It will begin with all of us in this room and around the world. I'm tired of hearing another great message and doing nothing with it. I don't want this seed to fall on empty soil. I want it to fall on the soil of my heart. I want it to bear fruit. I want my life, your life, our lives. Jesus said, lift up your eyes. The harvest is all around you. Souls on my mind and my mind on souls. Souls on my mind and my mind on souls. I want to throw party after party after party after party. Those of you right now who don't even have jobs that are watching me, I dare you to go on the streets. I dare you to carry the kingdom on your head. I dare you to chase after what God is after and watch. You're going to have multiple options, multiple options for you to choose from. Come on, lift up your hands. Come on, lift up your hands. Jesus. Malubeli kabra na kananda. Woo. Luza da libra na kabanu kevrelese. I'm praying for you right now. I'm telling you from from the depth of my heart. I'm praying for you right now. Yerebele kebra na kabana kabana nga le kebrusa tabaleke. Yerebeli kabra na kabananda. Lord, have your way, have your way, have your way, have your way, God. Move by your Spirit, pour our hearts tonight. Stir us up, God. Open eyes to see the lost. I'm telling you, there's such an anointing. There is an anointing that breaks the yoke. Hallelujah. There, Jesus. Hallelujah. Fire is burning in my bones. Fire on the altar. Lord, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying now. Let there be a shift in the body. Chasing after your heart. Chasing after lost souls, God. Yeah. There's fire on the altar. Let it burn. Let it burn after you. Come on, somebody call the name. We're chasing after your heart, God. We're running after what you want. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I'm after what you're after, God. My life for your glory, 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 our lives for your glory, God. Life is short. Lord, I pray for everybody right now under the sound of my voice. May our lives count in this season. May our lives count in this season. May there be such a desire to bring glory, bring glory, bring glory, bring glory, bring glory, bring glory to the heavens. Bring glory to God. So open up the heavens, 
Pour down the rain of your glory. Pour down the rain. Pour down the rain of your glory. Pour down the rain. Somebody's hungry. Pour down the rain. The land is dry. Pour down the rain. Pour down the rain, God. The rain of your glory, the rain of your power, the rain of miracles, signs and wonders, pour it down. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise and glory. We give you the praise and glory. If you're going to clap, clap to him. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the ancient of days, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that we're going to do something with this message. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Pour down the rain. Pour down the rain. Can I pray for you just one more time? Just lift up those hands towards heaven. I come against the dryness, I come against the confusion. I just come against all the things that are standing in your way. All the things that are acting as an impediment, as an obstacle, as a challenge for you to really step into what it is God has for you. In 2020, let the wind of God's presence blow behind the cells of your own wings in the name of the Lord Jesus. I pray things will happen to you that nobody knows how to explain it because you're chasing after what God is after you're chasing what God is after I said you're chasing after what God is after I said you're chasing I said you're chasing in the morning you're chasing everything you're doing you're chasing after what God is chasing after Lord I thank you for this right now in the name of the Lord Jesus and the body of Christ says a big amen how many of you truly felt the presence of God in this place? It's all over this place. It, we could go, keep going all night, but we're not going to do that. Let's go ahead right now and get our tithes and offerings prepared. And let us give generously tonight. Those of you who are saying, you know, I want to give towards the Indian mission. We leave this coming Sunday. We'll be leaving for India. And I've been praying for the nation of India that God will raise another Billy Graham, another... Kelly Agueze, another Red Monkey, another Esther, another Joseph. God will raise mighty men and women of God from that nation to shake that nation from its core. Praise God. The ways to give are right there online. We also have Cash App. Those of you who want to give through our Cash App, our Cash App for the ministry is 1 billion souls, all spelled out. 1 billion souls all spelled out that's our cash app for those of you who want to give through the cash app we're going to make sure we add that uh to this so they can also see that all right praise god praise god praise god let's give generously tonight i promise you god is going to lift something from you one billion souls if you want to send us a mail in the mailbox you can also do that all you have to do is go to 633movement.com and see all the ways to give. If any one of you want to give through your credit cards or debit cards, just lift up your hands. We'll get to you and receive our offerings from your credit card and debit card. We've got people that can take that directly from you here. If you're writing out a check, just write out to M633 Church. M633 Church will take that from you. Praise God. There's also Vemom. Vemom is another app you can use, just like Cash App. You can give through that. Praise God. Those of you who want to be a personal blessing to us, our own personal Cash App and uh, other ways you can give to us are also there on site. And you can give that way also. Our P.O. Box is 16630. Is that it? 16630. 
16630, PO Box 16630, Jackson, Mississippi, 39236. So you can sell, send us your mail in the, in the mailbox. This coming Sunday, um, we're not going to have any service this coming Sunday night. That's the 2nd of February. We're not going to have any service here that night. But the next service, which is the 9th of February, Dr. Kelly is going to be preaching. She's going to be bringing an amazing word. Amen. It's going to be awesome. So she's going to be bringing an amazing word that day. But this coming Sunday night, just take it off. Have a great time in the presence of God. Amen. There are people with their envelopes there. All right. Lift up your offerings. I want to pray over it. Those of you giving online, you're giving through the cash app, you're giving through our online giving. There's PayPal. So many ways to give, all right? Lord, we thank you for these offerings. We bless your holy name. Lord, as we bring our seeds, our tithes, our offerings, we want to say thank you for the cross. Thank you for the shed blood. Thank you for laying down your life for us so that we may have life and live. Help us to use this life for your glory, God. This is our prayer. Moving forward in 2020, let it be all about what you're all about, God. When all about us is all about you and all about us is about what's important to you, then all these things that everybody's running helter skelter trying to make happen will be naturally happening for us. Lord, I pray this season we're going to key into this revelation. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen and amen. Go ahead, let's receive our offerings. And rain down. Let it rain down, let it rain down. Glory. Rain down, rain down, rain down. Glory God. Let it rain, 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 let it rain. Let it rain, 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 let it rain. Let it rain, God, let it rain, God, let it rain, let it rain. All over this room, all over this place, all over this world, let it rain, let it rain. Let it rain, God, let it rain, 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 rain, God, rain, God. Let your glory rain down, let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. Rain, God, rain, God, let it rain. Fill their lives with glory, fill their lives with your presence. Let it rain, God, let it rain, let it rain. Signs and wonders, let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. Open heavens, open doors, let it rain, God, let it rain. Let it rain, 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 God, my root de keta la cabra la cabana. Let it rain. Let it rain, God. Let your glory rain down. Amen. All right, boo, you got to come up and say something and also tell us about the upcoming conference that will be happening in Arlington, Texas a couple of months from now. Also, um, my wife's birthday is right around the corner. She's coming to the big 4-0. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big clap, clap offering. Happy, 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 happy birthday. So we want to celebrate her in such a big way um, in her in her 40s a lot happens when you turn 40 a lot happened to Moses when he turned 40 <laughs> I didn't think you were going to go there but okay <laughs> alright All right. so tell us about what's coming and whatever's on your mind I have a question how's everybody I have a practical question for you, sir, because you did so good tonight. For someone who was listening tonight, and they're like, okay, like, I get it. 
Did y'all get it? But how do I get from doing what the Gentiles do, because that's what I've grown up doing, and most of us are adults, so this isn't something that has happened overnight. It's been instilled in us. This is what we thought was normal. So, like, I know what I did, but I just want your your take just, you know, in a simple way to explain, because I think people may have wondered that, like, I want to make the shift, but how do I go from, you know, working two and three jobs and or just worrying about my bills and trying to figure out how to break out of that system? How, cause you, you, because you, it's, you can't just say, okay, I'm done with that. Like, how would you explain in a practical way how people can actually make that transition? All right. Good question. Um, I would say the following. I'm going to give you a practical answer, but let me say this before I give you that answer. I got two books that answers that question. Building Capacity, go get it. And um, look at the chapter that talked about vocational capacity. That means this is where you are. This is where majority of us are. We need a job. We got to work to make a living. So how do you make that transition while you're smack in the middle of working? What I would do if I were you would be this. If I am working a job, whether it's a nine to five or some of you, you work 10, 12 hours a day, I am going to dedicate, even if it's only 30 minutes of my time or an hour, I'm going to, in other words, I've given the world my best hours. I haven't given myself anything. So I'm going to extract 30 minutes or an hour out of the day. And the key is to keep it consistent. Okay. I'm going to enter into a covenant with God during that hour. And I'm going to say, God, I am serious about breaking out of this mold. Okay? That's, where, that's something practical that I can do right now. It's almost like you're working all these times. You come home, you're tired, you're worn, you're burnt out, and then all these other responsibilities you've got. You've got to find time. You've got to take some time in that 24-hour cycle and say, God, I'm going to give you, this is between you and I. And I need you to teach me how to move from point A to point B. Okay? So that is something you can actually initiate right now. And so what happens is if you, once you kind of carve out that time, okay, then begin to ask the Lord, Lord, how do I break this? How do I change this? Okay? But the actual way to, to do it is something I've written a whole book on. So I want you to, you know, I don't want to just give you the answer. I don't want the answer to come cheap to you. I want you to pay some price. I want you to pay your own price in discovering how you're going to move from point A to point B. Okay? You've done it. Okay? And, but you didn't know you were doing it. You want to share a little bit on, on how that happened? It's something I'm actually working on now, explaining that process, because I didn't just wake up one day and say, that's it. I'm done living paycheck to paycheck. And it makes me almost want to cry because I didn't even realize I was breaking out of it. Because I know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. I know what it's like not to have enough, to not have parents to call to ask for help. And it was really out of a conviction because I know the Holy Spirit was living inside of me. And he just told me one day, believe it or not, the first thing he said was, why don't you start making up your bed? before you leave in the mornings instead of just rushing out of the house your whole day just being all tore up like get some structure I was like okay I'm gonna do that for 21 days and a, I'm not gonna lie a book that changed my life is called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg The Power y'all need to be writing this down y'all want your life to change it changed me because it I'm real inquisitive and analytical and I and it was teaching me it's called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg and in this book it explained to me the power of habits. And I was like, I'm going to start simple. Just all this stuff I need to do, I'm just going to start by just taking an extra two minutes because it doesn't take any time to make up your bed. And after 21 days of that, I heard the Spirit of God say, now back your day up and spend 30 minutes with me and focus prayer before you go to work. Because what I was doing was while the kids was loading up because Christian of course he's the oldest so he was I don't know about 14 or 15 by then and so I would have him load up the rest of the kids and I'm, I'm trying to pray 
and while they load in the car. That's all the time I could find for God. But we want God to do so much for us, but we can't find time for him. And I felt convicted when I would do that. I was like, okay, I know some prayer is better than no prayer. But in my heart, I knew that I wasn't doing what God, I knew I wasn't living by my divine design. Now, did I know all this other stuff was going to happen? No. But the Spirit of God said, start waking up 30 minutes early. And before you know it, I began to do that every single morning. I was like, Lord, I just praise you. Never once did I say, get me out of this life that I'm in. Help me start living paycheck to paycheck. I just began to tell him how good he is and how grateful I am. And, and I, his presence began to be so sweet. And before you know it, it became 45 minutes. And then it became an hour. And there was a time that I was there. We would go, we wake up at 4 o'clock every morning and pray to 6. You know, and then during our fast, we wake up at 2 o'clock and pray to 6. And, and, the, and then when I had my surgery, it went from two hours to four hours to six hours to eight hours of me just journaling in my little closet and telling God how good he is and in one year's time the Lord blessed my life beyond measure and next thing you know I was able to put all my bills on auto draft and I was like oh my god I don't have to worry about this anymore like I can actually safely put something on auto draft and I went on my account you know drafting and then now, like, we went to a restaurant yesterday. I'm not trying to be funny, but when we walked out, somebody stopped the kids, and they were like, um, how much is the buffet? And I was like, I don't know, because I didn't look at the bill. I'm not trying to be funny, but I don't worry about that anymore, because I know God is faithful, and I know he's a provider. And as long as I'm getting his presence and giving him what's due to him, he will take care of me. So if you want to break out of the world system, because I was in prison, I didn't even know I was in prison. You could be so bound and not even know that you're bound. But if you really want to break free, just enjoy the sweetness of his presence and begin to say, God, break my heart for the things that break yours. And he'll begin to show you. And then you'll begin to pray for other people more than you pray for yourself. And then you'll find yourself not even asking for a whole lot. You're like, God, just show me how to, to, to serve your people. Show me how to use my oil. Show me how to pour my oil on people. And the more you do that, the more impact he'll give you, the more influence he'll give you, the more influence you have, the more money you will make. Now, you don't have to believe me, but I'm just telling you what I know to be true. That's why Empire, the conference that we're having in March, is so important. It's because we're going to spend three days telling you everything that we've gone through. And we've got other experts who are going to join us and really show you. Because you really, it's, of course, you got to have a job. I've had a job. I've had a job since I was, what, 15 at Wendy's. Praise God. But that wasn't God's best for me. Because I was working two and three jobs. And then I didn't have any time for anybody. I didn't have time for myself. I didn't have time for my kids. And I didn't have time for God. And that is not God's plan. That is not his best for your life to work two and three jobs. And don't, I mean, I would work so much, I wouldn't even sleep at night. Like, how do you work 24 hours and not sleep? Get my check, pay everything, and then I'm back at it again. Next thing you know, 10 years have gone by living like that. That is not God's design for us. But the world teaches you that it is and that's what is referenced in Matthew 6 and 32 that's what the Gentiles do that's not what we do what we do has to set, be separate from what they do otherwise how are you going to know them from us if we're all begging and borrowing and crying and rolling over why would somebody serve us our God if our lives look just like the Gentiles no no we have to live by divine design so I pray because this was a mighty word tonight if you didn't give tonight, shame on you because this was a word to sow into. I'm not trying to raise the offering because I don't. we don't have to raise the offering. I'm just telling you, you got to be able to understand when something valuable is coming forth. And if you really want your life to change, one more thing I'm going to say, because I said I might preach about it this week. I was in my closet this morning and I took a break and I called my sister because we've been teaching about the oil. We've been teaching for like three weeks about the oil. And the Lord told me this morning, not only is your oil valuable, not only can the oil not be borrowed, you've got to know what makes your oil flow. You've got to know what makes your oil flow. And I said, what makes my oil flow? My prayer closet makes my oil flow. My giving makes my oil flow. And as long as I stay in his presence, and as long as I am generous because I gave my way, I, I prayed my way, and I gave my way out of poverty, I'm never going back. Because I know what causes my oil to flow. Now, you need to get in your space with God. 
I don't care if it's your shower, your car, your cubicle, the park. You got to find that place where your oil flows. And don't ever disconnect from that sweet place. Because I've learned that once I figured out what causes my oil to flow, the enemy works over time to keep me away from the things that causes my oil to flow. Everything comes up to try to keep me out of that closet. Every thought comes in my mind when it's time to give. But no, I know. I know for myself what causes Kelly's oil to flow. Now everybody else has to figure it out who doesn't know. And then you stay true to that and God will see you through. Amen. Amen. Maybe you need to teach on, um, you know, how to make your oil flow. That's really beautiful. Um, Praise God. I tell you, this has been such a burden. Uh, Thank you all so much for just joining us. Um, I know that all the souls that are going to be worn in India, we're going to be there for almost two weeks. All the souls that are going to be worn there will be credited to your all account, and it will speak for you for generations to come. I want us to pray for, for everybody watching us right now one more time. Lord, your name is faithful. The Bible says you show mercy even to 10,000 generations. When we become serious about you, everything changes. Lord, you've got your kids. We are your kids. We belong to you. We are all here, God, and we ask for your help. Help to know you better, to serve you better. As we look back at what happened this morning, somebody famous, well-known around the world, 41 years old, just like that. So we pray the prayer of Moses. Help us to number our days. Help us to make it count. God, may we focus on our soul winner's account and begin to fill that account up. Like Kelly said, may we get into our space. And instead of even asking, how do you get me out of this? Let us just say, God, what is on your heart? What what would you want me to do? Uh, how would you want me to just chase after you? Lord, I thank you that I pray that all of us listening to this message today, everybody in this room, everybody online, our lives for his glory, that is becoming almost a prayer model that we pray our lives for your glory, God. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done tonight. May it stand the test of time. Somebody's going to, I know, I don't know who this person is, but I sense somebody's going to run with this message. Somebody's going to say, you know what, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm I'm, I'm going out there and I'm going to put my life on the line. I'm going to pour myself out and do this. Give my life for others and watch what God is going to do. God, may you raise a greater than Billy Graham out of this message. May you raise a greater than Rehat Bonke out of this message. May you raise a greater than Oz out of this message. I pray this, I ask for this, God. If this is all I teach, if this is my last message, God, my heart is satisfied. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody says amen. Amen. I just want to say one last thing. And this is not a reference to Kobe because I don't I didn't know him personally, even though I felt like I did, just a year older than me. But there was a thought, and all the others that were on the on the helicopter and all of that, and we pray for their family, we've been praying for them all day. But what I what I was just thinking and talking to God about, I say it all the time. I used to be afraid to die. I'm not trying to freak y'all out. Uh, but I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to live my life doing the life that I have, the time that I have. I don't want to spend the time that I have doing good things, but it wasn't God things. Because you can do a lot of good things, but you can be so far away from your divine design. Like, Lord, whatever days, whatever number of days we have left, I don't want to be saying that I did good things. 
I want to be said that I, that I moved the nations in prayer, that, that God used us to advance the kingdom. Let them say, oh, they were kingdom shakers. Oh, the heavens are rejoicing. Not, oh, they were good people. They were sweet people. They were talented people. Let them speak about the good that we did in the sense that we advanced the kingdom because that's what really matters, what we do for the kingdom, not the good things. You can do good things that are far from what God has called you to do. So may we all flow in our divine designs, what God created you to do. And the only way you're going to really know the specifics of that, got to get into his presence. Amen. Father God, be with everybody as we leave today. Thank you for the word that has gone forth. Thank you for these amazing people who came out on this raining Sunday night to hear a word from you. God bless them. God lift them. God protect them. We cover them, their families, their possessions, all that concerns them in your precious blood. And Father, we pray that this oil, this precious oil that you've anointed us with, God, that it will continuously flow as we stay in your presence and we cry out to you, God, that you will break our hearts for the things that break yours, Lord. We declare this word tonight has not fallen on deaf ears or hardened hearts, but no, God, we will be the people who will run with this word. And may a boldness come upon us now, may it fall upon us now, God, to go out of this place and boldly tell others about you, God. We don't want to do good things. We want to do things that will move and shake and advance the kingdom. And that is our prayer tonight, and we know by faith that we have been heard. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you. Make sure you greet somebody on your way out. This coming Sunday, no service. The Sunday after that, the 9th of February, we have a great service here. See you then. God bless. Those online, God bless.